Hi class! Today I'm going to be talking to you about using language to style your speech. So essentially you want to pick the right words to paint the right image for your audience. Speeches are prepared specifically for the ear. It's oral style. There's nothing to look at, no other engaging factors aside from your ears, really. Especially if you're listening to something like a podcast. So you definitely want to make it interactive with your audience, you know, if you want to do a raise a hand or ask questions. And then, of course, you want to repeat what you're saying, you know, really get your point across, remind your audience, this is what I'm talking about, this is what I'm talking about. You want there to be a spoken style to it, so you don't need to sound super formal. And of course, if it's a formal event, then uphold to that standard, but you need to make sure everybody understands what you're talking about. And then, of course, with the understanding, you need to be very clear. You don't want to dance around your topic, and you want to be clear with your parts, you know, beginning, middle, end. If I say, thank you for your time, you know, this is this is when you clap for me. So, just things like that. So, with getting your audience to understand what you're talking about, you really want to dumb down the subject. So, if I was listening to a speech, and it was a bunch of scientists, you know, publicists, I don't think I know what you were talking about. Like, research papers, they, those don't make sense to me. So, but if you dumb it down from those scientific terms to more common language, I'm going to know what you're talking about, which makes your speech more entertaining for me to listen to. I want to stay tuned in. And then, of course, you have um, personal speech, which is part of that interactiveness I talk about. So, usually when you're speaking, unless, you know, podcasts or something like that, you're in the room with your audience. And, of course, I'm not with you guys right now, but if I was, I'd, you know, say us, you know, these people in the room. If you're sitting here, you understand that college sucks, that kind of thing. You want to be inclusive. So, um, moving on to another thing you want to include in your speech is vivid imagery. I would say this is the most important part the book touched on, um, and there were a couple different ways they said you could do that. So, what you want to do is avoid what they call abstract language, which is these general terms that are really interpreted. So, you know, if I say freedom, someone might interpret that as no more slavery or a woman's right to vote, you know, where freedom to me might mean like equal pay or whatever. So it's it's very different. And then also people are saying love, you know, um, is it a romantic love? Is it like you love your mom? So that that's a very up to interpretation. So you can't ver paint a very vivid, common image with that. So you'd want to avoid that language. And instead, you want to have concrete language, which is very specific words. If I say a mountain, you've probably all seen the mountains or pictures of them. If I say the beach, if I say a cat, if I say, you know, that this was heavy or this this was very light, you know, you know, heavy is going to be hard to pick up. A light is going to be nothing. So... It's just important to use those concrete words. And you see a lot of people mess up with this in public speaking using those abstract words. You see politicians, you know, oh, we're going to create a free country, you know. Well, what does that mean? You know, and so you don't want to tiptoe around like that. And another part of imagery, on top of being concrete, you have to be very colorful. You want to avoid mundane language. So if I said... I looked over in that direction. I might say and said, I gazed over into that direction because that's more appealing to hear to you, the audience. And then, of course, another uh, good example would say, okay, the summer. And I might say, instead of the summer, I might say the weather was really hot outside. But, you know, this is Georgia. It gets 95 and you sweat when you walk out the door. So instead, I'm going to say there was some sweltering heat out today. And I might also talk about how humid it was or something like that, not just the sun beating down. So it just depends. You want to use that kind of language that gets your audience really thinking about what you want to have to say in their own head. Can I relate to that? And another thing that helps the audience relate to what you're talking about, and I think also ties into like the dumb it down thing, is figures of speech. So you want to use stuff like really basic similes, metaphors, you know, your audience is really going to react to that. So if you say, you know, this was, this thing that you don't understand, this scientific concept is like, and then you make it something relatable that most people are going to understand, 
that is easier for them to interpret like what your speech is really about and what point you're trying to make. So using similes and metaphors is definitely a really big one. But then you want to avoid others. So like you don't want to use cliches. Those are really predictable. Everybody knows what you're going to say. Everybody knows what comes next. And then stuff like mixed metaphors, which even reading the examples in the book, I was like, I have no idea what that means. That's really confusing. So it's basically comparing two unlike things. And then you want to also steer clear of analogies because sometimes, especially when you get into like extended metaphors and stuff like that, and like the extended analogies, then you kind of get lost or it might be like misleading to your audience. And I think uh, a lot of that just depends on where you are and like the culture of the place and stuff like that, which I will also touch on later. There's also a section about credibility. So essentially, you want to use good grammar. So you don't you don't want to get up there and sound super, you know, uneducated or like you don't know the language because you're giving a speech. You should know how to talk. And then it's also got to be really like common. So the way I'm talking to you now, of course, they're like fragments and bits of sentences. And I'm saying stuff that I might not normally say if I'm writing, you know, an essay, give or take. So you want to use that kind of grammar. And then also you want to be sensitive to where you are. So for example, my family is all from New England, you know, and those who aren't are Texas and Florida, not super Southern, like Georgia, Alabama, that kind of thing. So when we came here and when I was raised, I never heard the term buggy, which most people understand is a shopping cart. So I wouldn't go up to New England, you know, to my family in mass and start talking about, did we need a buggy at the grocery store? Because they would be like, there's a, there's a bug? Where? Wh where's the mosquito? However, you know, I work at a grocery store down here. So if I say, hey, do, do you want to hold on to your buggy? They know what that means. They, they understand that buggy is shopping cart. So you want to be careful of stuff like that. And then, of course, um, there's the emotional meeting that ties into stuff. So if... I say, you know, I thrifted this top today. Someone else might take that as, oh, she bought a $2 top, which may it happen $2, yes. But to me, that's thrifting. It's, you know, it's it's more of a, a skill, I suppose. There's not an emotional meeting with thrifting to me that necessarily ties into cheap, not well-made. Because I have bought designer stuff at thrift stores. I have brought prom dresses at thrift stores, which were originally hundreds and hundreds of dollars more at retail price. So cheap and thrifted does not necessarily mean the same thing, whereas they might to other people, depending on like the emotional and cultural differences. So just be careful of that. There's also some other things that will make you sound really powerful when you're giving your speech. So there's active and passive voice. And essentially the difference is active is really clear and assertive. You're like, th this is what it is. Where passive is kind of like, yeah, that could be it. Um, so, so to give you an example, which really helps you understand, I think, um, if you're using passive voice, you might say, well, four years ago, a president was elected. However, if, you, you know, and it sounds more formal too and assertive if you say the voters elected a president. So it's just kind of that thing. It's it's just for the, the way it comes off the tongue for your audience to really give you credibility. It's like, oh, you know what you're talking about. Okay, when you use that kind of voice. And then as I've been talking about this whole time, and I think ethically is the most important section here, is respect. So uh, out of all the other things, respect is a big one. And they talk about in the book cultural differences and like gender differences. So you want to be careful with the region and the group. So there are some like specific terms to a region or a group which are called colloquial expressions. You want to avoid using those. So you know of course um, you don't want to be stereotypical either. You know, you don't want to group people in because they live in this place. You know, we, we don't call everybody who's southern rednecks. That, that, that's stereotyping. That's fitting them into a group. Just because you live in Georgia doesn't mean you're redneck. And just because you're redneck doesn't mean you live in Georgia. So you just want to be careful of that. And also, I think a big thing that hits home for a lot of us women in the room is that you always think of, like, when people talk about doctors or scientists and media and stuff, I think your brain jumps to the fact that it's going to be a man. Or you think about someone who's like on the front lines, like you military or Navy, you're going to think about a man. However, like, the, 
there are women that fill those positions. Like there is someone I know and she's a woman in the Air Force. So then you think about stuff like that. So you don't want to immediately jump to those masculine expressions and those masculine pronouns. So if you're going to say, then the scientist, he did this, you might say something that's really non, you know, biased. Um, some of those like non-binary pronouns. Then the scientist, they did this. So that way... It's just a scientist. It's not a man or a woman. So I think that has to do a lot with respect. And just on like a really ethical, moral ground, that is very important here. And then, of course, we just have some other general speech things, such as repetition. This really drills into the audience head, you know, at the very beginning in your thesis, this is my point. At the first body paragraph, this is my point. Here are some things to back it up. Second, this is my point. Here are some other things to back it up. You know, th so on and so forth as you make your way through your speech. And then, of course, at the very end, you want to say, oh, by the way, well, this was what it was about. And, um, you know, just, just, just a reminder that that was what it was about. So that way your audience isn't left wondering, huh, what was the point? It's they, they know the point. They've heard it several times. And then it also gave some examples of like different types of repetition. So you have anaphora, which is at the very start. So to give an example of this, you think about I have a dream speech. I couldn't say a line for line, but most lines in that speech start with, I have a dream that this, that, and that. I have a dream that, and that's, that's anaphora there, that kind of repetition. And then there's also, okay, probably gonna say this wrong, epiphora, which goes at the very end. So they had an, a speech by President Obama in there. And at the very end of every sentence, you know, he says this, that, and that. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. You know, sentence, yes, we can. So it repeats at the very end. So you're hearing that same thing over and over again. So it really emphasizes the point. I have a dream. Yes, we can do this. So the audience really connects to that through repetition. So... To summarize, in, in all, we have, you need it easy for your audience to follow, whether that is dumbing stuff down, using casual language, you know, making a clear beginning and an end, repeating your point. It needs to be easy for them to follow. It needs to be respectful. You know, let's not, let's not use genders. Let's not use stereotypes. Be respectful. It needs to have basically just fewer fewer words. You don't want to confuse everybody by, you know, trying to sound smart and using a whole bunch of words to get your point across. It needs to be, this is it. Don't need to bat around the bush. And then, of course, you want active voice. You want to sound aggressive. You want to sound like you know what you're talking about. You want to sound credible. You want to use grammar. Know what you're talking about. And then, of course, you can add in figurative language and stuff, again, in that easy to follow. So at the end of the day, you also, the, the biggest thing, repeat it. Repeat your point and be respectful. All right. And that is chapter 16 summed up for you. Thank you for watching.